You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we are going to do a program on confession. Um, We have Lent here that started, and... um, What we want to do is talk about confession because if we don't remove the sin and the obstacles between us and God, then really nothing else matters. God can dump all of his grace on us and he can, um, you know, we can fast and we can give alms. But if our heart is full of sin, then um, that relationship with his love is still blocked. It's still ruined. So confession is super important. And I debated doing two podcasts on it because I have so much material, but I think I'm just going to do one. And if it's a little bit longer, then you can listen to it in two parts. Um, But there's so much that I want to share with you about this mystery. But at the beginning, we're just going to do a song um, about Jesus as the good shepherd, as his love, the king of love my shepherd is. And um, I'm sure you all know it from church at times, right? (laughs) And then... um, We'll go into the podcast. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. shepherd is whose goodness fails me never I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine for
full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Right? I thought I started late enough where the sun won't be right on my face like last time. I think if I sit up here, then you can see me better, right? Um, whenever I try to adjust the curtains, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, kind of like everything. So um, what I would like to do at the beginning is talk just briefly, very briefly, about a few passages in Scripture that have to do with the sacrament of confession. And then kind of pop through the um, catechism a little bit and then talk about some really holy confessors, some priests who um, did their job so well that they died for it, some of them. Some of them were a martyr of the confessional. They spent hours and hours, but some actually um, were killed because they wouldn't reveal um, the sins told them in confession. And then um, at the end, I have some quotes of the saints just because I think it's inspiring when I go through and I find, you know, I search out different quotes and um, it always just kind of pulls together to me the riches of what the church teaches, right? So the first passage that I want to talk about is the call of Matthew, sweet Matthew, right? I think, yep, you can see him up there in the top corner. Here's my Matthew. Well, oh, maybe you can't. You see John here. The one next to him is Matthew. But um, Matthew, the tax collector, right? As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. While he was at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He heard this and said, Those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn the meaning of the words, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So here you see that Jesus not only searches out the sinner, Matthew, who a tax collector wasn't a sinner just because he collected taxes. Um, in a lot of ways, they were considered like betrayers of the Jews because they were working for the Romans. And most often they collected more money than what the Romans said and then just kept it for themselves, right? So they were considered, you know, a very sinful um, people um, collectively. Any tax collectors? Just we're all together, right? I mean, it says, you know, he was sitting with tax collectors and sinners. You know, that's the, the way they called them. You know, all, they grouped them all together. And yet not only Jesus went out and he sought out the sinner, Matthew. He looked at him with love. He called him. And not only did he come to his house and eat with him, but then he asked him to be one of his apostles. He made him one of his favorites, right? So that should give great hope to anyone who feels like they're lost in sin and that, um, you know, they're unlovable to God because God searches out the sinner and he loves them because they need his love. They need his mercy, right? If you're well, then you don't need a savior. You know, if we were perfect, like, you know, Adam and Eve were created in the garden before they fell, we, they didn't need Jesus to redeem them the same way that they did afterwards when they had sin and heaven was closed from them. And you could say, well, Our Lady didn't. Well, Our Lady did, but she received that gift of redemption earlier so that she was always immaculate and pure. But even Our Lady in her perfection needed Jesus, right? So, you know, when we're humble and we can find those areas of our life where we need Jesus the most, our woundedness, our fallenness, our weakness, our sinfulness, and we can bring them to him as the good physician, then he can heal them, right? 
That's what confession is. Confession is not a laundry mat where you just go in, say some sins, the priest gives you absolution to wash off and send you out. Confession is a place where you meet in persona Christi with Jesus Christ. And you can be sure that every word you speak to that priest in the confessional, Jesus is listening to. It's like having his full undivided attention. Now, not every priest is a perfect um, physical example of Christ's compassion to us, right? I mean, I've heard many times people say, but the priest was so mean, or the priest did this or that. But you know that his action in the sacrament is being in the person of Christ. So he might, you know, say something off the cuff, like advice in a situation that might not be perfect apropos or you know or might hurt you but um his word you speaking to that priest is you speaking to jesus and his words of absolution that he's not allowed to change from the church's formula is jesus christ saying i forgive you right so you know sometimes people say i don't go to confession because i went once and the priest said something that you know, I, I didn't like, or he, you know, it was, it was bad advice. <laughs> that can happen. Um, but that's not the part of the confession that is in persona Christi. The fact that you are speaking your sins to Christ present in that ordained minister. He's, he's listening to them as Christ. And then when he says that prayer of absolution, that's why he can't change the words. That's him acting like when he, when Jesus said to Peter, you know, he breathed on the apostles and he said, whose sins you have forgiven are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. He gave them that power. It's like um, when you have a parent and they get a babysitter and the parents tell the babysitter what to do. When the babysitter tells the children, they have that power to tell the children because the parents gave it to them. And they're not supposed to be making up the house rules. They're supposed to be following what the parents said, right? Same thing is like with a priest. He enters into Christ and his authority. And you can be sure every word that you whisper in the confessional is listened to by Jesus Christ. And he looks at you with love like he looked at Matthew. And he says, I am your physician. I want to touch your wounds. I want to touch your leprosy, your, he your sin. I want to heal you. I want to strengthen you. And then you have those words of absolution. And sometimes, you know, a priest might have that special grace of being a really good instrument of the Holy Spirit and like giving advice or spiritual direction. And there've been times in my life where I've prayed really hard that God answer me through Jesus Christ in the priest. And I've gone to confession. And the priest who doesn't know me or the situation speaks right to my heart, right? But I've too been with others where you go and it's the priest is very off in um, some of the advice that he gives, but that's not what you're bound to. You're bound to speak your sin and then to do the penance that's given to you and to receive that absolution. Those are the, like the basic. And you can be positive. It's a straight shot to God. You are telling those sins to God, not the man, the priest, to Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest sitting here with us right here in this image, right? And that he is pouring his blood and his love and his mercy on you through those words of absolution. And Jesus loves you in that sacrament, right? I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's why I always loved for many years to go to confession behind a screen. Because then, um, no matter, you know, it, was, it wasn't the priest. I would shut my eyes. I was speaking to Jesus. I was hearing those words back from him. And that was Jesus Christ. It kind of helped me to picture that that wasn't a man. That was Jesus. Sometimes it is helpful to also go face to face. Um, and then you can connect better sometimes with the priest and you can like read their facial expressions and you can explain yourself better. And it's, you know, th there are gifts to that um, option in the church as well. Both are beautiful. But when people tell me they're afraid or that they, you know, they don't want to go, I always say, go behind the screen, go very short. You don't have to say a lot. Just go with your little list, tell Jesus, 
But no, it's more than just a laundromat. It's a personal meeting where the crucified Lord takes his wounded hand, touches it, places it on your heart as those priests, that priest is saying those words. And he's healing you. It's very beautiful. So the call of Matthew, right? Jesus not only seeks out the sinner and calls him to himself, but then he gives him a job. It's not just, I forgive your sin. Go in peace. Go and be my, you know, my disciple, my apostle. You know, sometimes you can get really beautiful advice for your vocation in the confessional. Because, you know, you're not going just to tell your sin. You're going, Father Flanagan, who is a very holy, saintly priest, who founded the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, Salt. And he used to tell us, you know, that uh, the confessional is not a laundromat. It's a place where you go not just to tell your sin, but where you discuss with the Father in heaven the work he's given you to do on earth and how it's going. And, you know, where you're struggling, where you're not. It's kind of a beautiful way to think about it, right? So you want to, it's a place where you can really open your soul to the Lord. The Lord knew that Matthew had been sinning. And he loved him anyway. And he called him. And he called his friends that were sinners. And he ate with them. And he defended them when they were ripped on, right? Right? And he said, I didn't, he didn't say, oh no, Matthew's not a sinner. He speaks truth. But he said, sinners need a doctor. Sinners need healing and forgiveness. I didn't come to those who say, I haven't done anything wrong, right? I can, because then you can't receive the mercy of God if you won't admit your fault or your wound. You know, it's frustrating when somebody's really hurt you to not be able to forgive them because they don't have the humility to say, you know what, I was wrong and I'm sorry. But Matthew had that humility, and Jesus was able to really help him, and not only to forgive his sin and to heal him, but to call him into a great ministry so that we're still talking about him 2,000 years later, right? Another beautiful story, it's probably my favorite of, of um, the gospel when it comes to the forgiveness of sins, is the pardon of the sinful woman. And a Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him. And as he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at table, there was a sinful woman in the city who had learned that he was at table in the house of the Pharisee. Bringing an alabaster, alabaster flask of ointment, she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with the ointment. When the Pharisee who had, come to who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus said to him in reply, Jesus read his heart, he read his, his thoughts, and he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people were in debt to a certain creditor, one owed 500 days wages and the other owed 50. Since they were unable to repay the debt, he forgave it for both. Which of them will love him more? Simon said in reply, the one I suppose whose larger debt was forgiven. Then Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet, but she has bathed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she has not ceased kissing my feet since the time I entered. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. So I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the others at table said to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Such a beautiful story of a woman who is so sorry for having offended Jesus. 
that she go, publicly goes in front of him, knowing that people are going to mock her, weeps at his feet, dries her, his feet with her hair, and anoints his feet with oil. And what does Jesus say? Her many sins have been forgiven, and hence she has shown great love. It was because Jesus had mercifully forgiven her, poured out the Holy Spirit, which is the love between the Father and the Son, on this woman, that she was then able to return that love to Jesus, right? We can only love with a love that comes from the Father, given to us as a gift in the Holy Spirit through the Son, right? And so this woman, because she was so humble and was able to admit her sin and accept the mercy of God, was able to love much. Now, St. Therese of Lisieux read that passage and she was worried because she hadn't been a big sinner. And her father said, you know, Jesus saved you and gave you much love before you even fell, right? So it's possible that God would do that as well. But... Um, you know, that's another thing to mark is that not only does Jesus, you know, call us out of sin like Matthew and forgive us and eat with us, spend time with us, and then give us a mission. But like this woman, he gives us a new heart, a new love. And what you see in both of these is that Jesus defends the woman. I always love that. Jesus is our defender even when we're sinful, right? Should be example to us to always defend people. Then we have later on in Luke, a couple more parables. One is of the lost sheep. The tax collector sinners were all drawing near to listen to him. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them, he addressed this parable saying, what man among you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them would not leave the 99 in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it. And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. So he's saying that, you know, especially priests as, you know, an image of the good shepherd, that we should not only not avoid people in sin, but go out and search for them and try to call them back into the fold. And if a priest sees a certain soul who's particularly struggling alone, who um, has been really wounded or, or really sinful, one or the other, Instead of shunning them and saying, get away from me, I don't want anything to do with you. They should sit down with them and say, you know, how can I help you? How can I get you back on the right track? Because Jesus, that's what Jesus would do. It's like the parable of the lost coin. What woman having 10 coins and losing one would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents, right? So it's the same idea that we're to go out and we're to look for those who are neediest. You know, you want to be sure to make sure you don't have preferential love for people um, in a selfish way. Like, I like these people better, so I'm just going to be with them, right? Especially when you're in a ministry. So if you're a priest or you're in the missions. But there are certain souls that might call forth a greater attention of yours because they need more, right? Um, you know, if you, if you meet somebody who has a particular need that others aren't able to help, then you might give them more time than you would the average person. Sometimes God asks that of us, right? So a priest needs to be very attuned to the Holy Spirit so he knows truly when God is asking him to take care of a soul and to be faithful to them. And then you have the parable of the lost son. 
And he tells that story of a man having two sons and the one came and said to the father, I want my inheritance. And he went out and he, you know, spoiled it on all sorts of, of sinful lifestyle. And then he was starving and he went to work and was feeding the pigs and eating the food of the pigs. And he thought, this is ridiculous. I'll just go home and be a servant to my father. I'll apologize. And when the father caught sight of him a long way off, he was filled with what? Compassion. He wasn't angry and said, you didn't do what I told you, or you were selfish, you were wrong. You know, I never liked you. <laughs> it's not what the father said. He ran to his son. He embraced him and kissed him. His, his son was humble and said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fat calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. You know, and a lot of times people can act like that older brother that comes and he gets angry and he says, why are you celebrating? You know, he did something not bad. And, um, what does the father say? You know, everything I have is yours, but this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive. He was dead and now he's alive. That's how quick the father is to forgive us of our sins. We should never be afraid to go back and tell him that we're sorry. He knows our weakness. He knows what we've done. What makes him sad is when we reject what he gave us to save us from sin. He took his perfect son and allowed him to be crucified and murdered and to suffer the agony of hell in order to save us. So when we go to the father in confession and say, I'm sorry, when the priest gives those words of absolution, it's like pouring the blood of Christ on us from Calvary to heal us. What makes the father sad is when we say, no, 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 I don't want it. Or I'm not worthy. Well, of course you're not worthy. But Jesus already paid the price. He already won. All he wants is for us to be humble enough to accept it, right? Have you ever had somebody try to give you a gift that you didn't necessarily want? Or you felt bad that they gave you? You know, oh, they sacrificed too much. The worst thing you can do is say no and, and reject it. To reject a gift is prideful always, right? You should, it's like a child, you know, brings you a picture. You could say, oh, well, that was ugly and I didn't like it anyway. <laughs> that would be mean. I've got, you know, under my bed, I've got to stack this big of pictures from, you know, the last 20 years of my nieces and nephews, 30, some of them. And I don't keep them all. You know, many of them end up eventually being thrown away. I keep the ones that were, you know, most meaningful or took the longest time or something. But at the moment, you always rejoice in it. You're always gracious and humble to accept that gift. And that's true when a gift is imperfect. The gift that the Father's giving us in confession is a perfect gift. It's actually something we need. It's actually better than anything we could think up of desiring. It's eternal salvation. It's rectitude of our heart's relationship with God and with each other. You know, if you've ever had a relationship with another person that's broken, then you take it to confession. And God can heal it. Sometimes the other person has a really, you know, hard or sinful heart. So you might not see a, a um, healing of that relationship immediately or even sometimes in this life, depending how hardened they are in sin. But it's such a beautiful way to heal a relationship. If you can bring it to Jesus in confession and say, you know what, I wronged this person. Or this person wronged me and I'm having a hard time with it. And then God can reach in and touch that wound and touch the sin involved and forgive it. Especially if it's your sin that you're confessing, right? And if it's just, you know, a wrong that's been done to you, you still show that wound to your doctor, you know, the divine physician. It's not a man. It's Jesus Christ in the, in the confessional. And there's an element of healing that can come in that. 
you know, it doesn't, you can't say, you know, I have cancer and then it's gone in confession. You know, you still have to go to a doctor or, you know, you might have been, you know, you know, severely abused by your husband for years and years. So like you might need a psychologist or you might need, um, you know, a women's shelter to hide from him. Or, you know, there are different kinds of, God uses the human ordinary means sometimes too, right? He uses both. Grace builds on nature. But there is an element of healing and peace that come through confession. And that's why in the catechism, confession is under, you know, the sacraments of healing, right? Healing of body and mind and soul. So we have that. And then at the very end, I just want to mention John 4. Because it's where Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman. And here she's lived with all these different men. That's sinful. That's wrong. And none of them were her husband. But again, Jesus seeks out the sinner. He goes to her. He says, give me a drink. He doesn't shun her. And he's, he's saying, give me a drink. That's saying, you still have something beautiful to offer to me. You know, you can still... Um, enter into a relationship, a friendship with me, even if you've committed a sin. And he draws her to himself. He's got to work on her. It's not even that she was seeking him out. Jesus saw into the soul of this woman a woundedness and thought, I want to go heal her. And he went close to the well and he asked her for a favor. Why? Because he knew that she needed to love. And she needed something that he could give her. It would be like if you saw like a really sinful woman, you know, crying in the church and the priest comes through and says, you know what? I need some help. Do you want to help me? You know, usually, you know, that's not the response that a human would have to somebody like that. But it's drawing them to yourself. You know, can you help me so that I can help you? It's really beautiful and really humble, too. And they talk about her life and he reads her heart and she's blown away and he explains to her about prayer and, and you know, she, she starts to, to see that he's a prophet and then later that he's the Messiah. And then she goes off with a mission. It's like the Lord is forgiving her sins just by knowing them and still loving her through them. And she goes off and tells the whole village about it. You know, when God forgives our sins, he makes us whole so that we can complete whatever work it is that the Father has for us to do. It might just be being a better mother or teacher, you know, a religious sister. Being a, you know, a, a better businessman or a priest. But it also could be, um, you know, going off in some ministry somewhere. God will always give you a mission after he heals you because, um, you know, our sin wounds the whole church. And then, you know, our reconciliation with God helps the whole church. And that love and mercy that Jesus shares with us is not to be kept just for ourselves. There's another parable where, you know, you have the man who forgives the big debt of his like servant. And then the servant goes to his little servant who owes just a little bit of money and won't forgive. And Jesus uses that as an example of something gravely wrong. When God forgives us all of our sin, we have a responsibility to forgive everyone in our lives who's ever sinned against us. It's like God giving you, you know, a huge bowl of apples and you won't even give one little bite of one little apple to a starving child next door. Now that would be wrong. So when your, your sin is forgiven by God, when you accept that gift of his mercy, it's not just for you. It flows through you to everyone. Or it should. What does the catechism say about confession? Right? Let's touch on that. And, you know, once again, I want to say that, you know, this is why I put out the icon of Jesus with the sheep, Jesus the good shepherd, because Jesus in the confessional is the good shepherd. And what does he say in scripture? You know, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know, somebody bad sees the wolf coming and he runs off, not me. I am the good shepherd. I go forth with my rod and my staff and I fight off the evil. 
you know, and when the good shepherd sees a sheep strayed, what he leaves the 99, he goes off, he finds them, he pulls them home. So we have to remember that that's the kind of love that Jesus has for us. It's a shepherd who's willing to be crucified and die, who's willing to have a bloodied face to feed us right from his own heart, the Eucharist. You know, it's beautiful when you see a mother nurse a child. When you see a mother feed a child, it's beautiful. When you see a mother nurse a child, it's like the food is coming from her. Well, what about Jesus, who gives us himself in the Eucharist? It's an incredible gift. That's the kind of love that he's giving to us in confession. You know, in the Eucharist, he feeds us. In confession, he bathes us. But he doesn't like, you know, scrub away the sin in a mean way, yelling at us for getting dirty. No. It's a bath of love. It's a beautiful bath of love. He wants to make us beautiful and without blemish. So what does the catechism say about confession? Those who approach the sacrament of penance obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him. So God forgives you what you do to him every time you sin. But at the same time, you're reconciled with the church which they have wounded by their sins and which by charity, by example, and by prayer labors for their conversion. When you sin, if I lie to my neighbor, and I not only offend God and I not only offend my neighbor, but I offend the entire church because I make, I'm part of the church and I make it dishonest. So like growing up, my dad used to have these family meetings where he would say like, you're a Klaska. And so you, what you do does not only reflect you, it reflects this entire family. And I've worked very hard to build up our reputation, and I don't want any one of you to ruin it. So if I did something wrong, I not only hurt myself or that person, I hurt all of my brothers and sisters, right? And so in the same way with sin in the church. So you, you hurt the church when you sin against your neighbor. And the church loves you so much that they pray all the time and they suffer and they work to help you receive that forgiveness from God so that you're reconciled to God and you're reconciled to them. You know, it's not just about, my sin is not just between me and God. I hurt the whole world every time I sin. And I help the whole world every time I pray or I live something virtuous. The sacrament of confession is called the sacrament of conversion because it makes sacramentally present Jesus' call to conversion, right? So it shows how Jesus calls us to change. It's not just saying our sin, but we have to make sure that we're willing to change. It's called the sacrament of penance since it consecrates the Christian sinner's personal and ecclesial steps of conversion, penance, and satisfaction. So it's called conversion because you turn from sin. It's called penance because you're you're willing to do something to make up for that sin, right? It's called the sacrament of confession since the disclosure or confession of sins to a priest is an essential element of the sacrament, right? It's an acknowledgement and praise of the holiness of God and his mercy towards sinful men. So it's not just saying, I did something wrong, but it's saying, I did something wrong, and you are incredible and awesome, Lord, and I praise you for the mercy that you're giving me right now. It takes it to that next step. It's called the sacrament of forgiveness, since by the priest's sacramental absolution, God grants the penitent pardon and peace. So we are forgiven. We're given pardon, but we're also given peace. And it's called the sacrament of reconciliation because it imparts to the sinner the love of God who reconciles. Be reconciled to God is what it says in Corinthians, right? He who lives by God's merciful love is ready to respond to the Lord's call. Go first be reconciled to your brother. So like if you do something wrong seriously against another person, you have a responsibility to go to God in confession and apologize, right? Oops, I'm going to do this. I I can't tell if you can even see me here. Sorry. I'm going to have to fix the sun thing next time. 
Um, but you also have a responsibility to go to the person that you've offended and to reconcile with them. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to call them every day the rest of their lives. But you know what? Go to them and say, I'm sorry. I abandoned you. I betrayed you. I lied about you. You know, I twisted the truth. I rejected you. And I love you and I'm sorry. We have a responsibility to do that if we want the forgiveness of God. And so the sacrament of reconciliation is something that we receive after baptism, right? In baptism, all of our sins are wiped away. And that's why at the beginning of the church, people would wait to be baptized till right before they died. But then they realized there was something not really right about that and that we need the graces of baptism our entire lives. So the sacrament of confession was formally kind of instituted so that if you fell in sin after baptism, you could still have a chance to get to heaven, right? Your sins could be um, forgiven again because you can only be baptized once. And it says in 1426, conversion to Christ, the new birth of baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the body and blood of Christ received as food have made us holy and without blemish. Just as the church herself, the bride of Christ, is holy and without blemish. Nevertheless, the new life received in Christian initiation has not abolished the frailty and weakness of human nature, nor the inclination to sin that tradition calls concupiscence which remains in the baptized, such that with the help and the grace of Christ, they may prove themselves in the struggle of Christian life. You know, even if your sin is forgiven, you might have a, wi a weakness or temptation to something. And we have to spend our whole life battling against that. Some people might battle against lust. Some people might battle against anger. Some people might get battle against self-pity or pride or jealousy. But there's a tendency towards sin that comes because of um, original sin, right? And because of the act of sin, you know, every time you sin, it makes it easier to sin again. So we have to battle against that, right? This is a struggle of conversion directed toward holiness and eternal life to which the Lord never ceases to call us. St. Ambrose always said there were two conversions that a person undergoes. In the church, there is the water and there is the tears. The water of baptism cleanses us the first time. And the tears of repentance, especially when shed in the confessional, are very powerful. Interior repentance is a radical reorientation of our whole life, a return, a conversion to God with all of our heart, an end of sin, a turning away from evil with repugnance toward the evil actions we have committed. At the same time, it entails the desire and res resolution to change one's life with hope in God's mercy and trust in the help of this grace. This conversion of heart is accompanied by salutary pain and sadness, with the, which the fathers of the church calls the affliction of spirit, and repentance of heart. You have to be able to be forgiven in confession. You, one of the things is you have to be sorry for your sin. You have to go with that. Ugh, I can't believe I did this. Like, not like, woohoo, you know, I slept with somebody I wasn't supposed to last night. You know, it ha you have to have sorrow for your sin and a, and a determination to not do it again, right? The human heart is heavy and hardened. God must give man a new heart. Conversion is first of all a work of the grace of God who makes our hearts return to him. Restore us to thyself, O Lord, that we may be restored. God gives us the strength to begin anew, and it is in discovering the greatness of God's love that our heart is shaken by the horror and weight of sin and begins to fear offending God by sin and being separated from him. The more you love God, the more you'll be aware of your own sin because you'll know him and his love so great. You'll see how you have offended him and then you'll be like repugnant against that. It'll revulse you. You'll say, oh, 
I've hurt the God that I love, right? The human heart is converted by looking upon him whom our sins have pierced. If you can't do a good examination of conscience before confession, take a bloody crucifix and look at it until you know how you are not like him, how you've offended him, how maybe, you know, maybe you haven't actively, you know, committed a mortal sin. But when you're persecuted, do you respond in love as he does? Is there an area of your heart that's bitter, that's selfish, that's lazy? What is it that you're struggling with? And St. Clement of Rome says, Let us fix our eyes on Christ's blood and understand how precious it is to his Father. For poured out for our salvation, it has brought to the whole world the grace of repentance. And, you know, it goes on to say how we're called to um, have interior penance through fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, right? And it's, it says that that covers a multitude of sin. When you fast, you deny yourself and offer it up. It strengthens your will against sin. When you pray, the closer you draw to God, the less you'll be able to be tempted, or you'll, you know, your will will be strengthened against sin. When you give alms, when you're charitable to other people, it covers a multitude of sin, right? And that's an interior um, penance. There are many different ways of receiving penance and forgiveness from God. That's one. One is in the Eucharist. Every time you receive the Eucharist, if you have a venial sin, it's taken away by the presence of God. If it's mortal, then you need to go to confession before you receive the Eucharist, right? There are certain seasons and days of penance in the church. You know, every Friday, we're supposed to do some little act of penance the whole year long to remember that Christ died on the cross to forgive us. And during Lent, we are not supposed to eat meat. We're supposed to do something greater, right? Lent is a season of penance. And we're supposed to have a continual process of conversion and penance. Penance should always be something kind of in the back of our head, right? And like what I like to do in life is when you meet with life's little inconveniences, just be grateful and offer it up. It's like what your grandma or your mom and dad used to say, offer it up, right? So you get a stone in your shoe, just offer it up. You know, you, you go to dinner and you really want to eat something and somebody else grabs the last piece offer it up, right? Sometimes when I'm going to bed at night, I'm super thirsty and I really want water. And I think I'll have a big glass of water in the morning (laughs) and I'll wait, (laughs) right? I'll just offer it up, right? You know, sometimes the Lord wants us just to find these little ordinary, you're really hot and your husband's cold or you're cold and your wife is hot or, you know, whatever it is, offer it up. Offer up temperature, offer up exercise. It's a beautiful thing. Those are all things that call us to penance, but it doesn't take away the need to still go to confession. Confession is something very important. Sin is before all else an offense against God, a rupture of communion with him, but at the same time, it damages communion with the church. For this reason, conversion entails both God's forgiveness and reconciliation with the church, which are expressed and accomplished liturgically by the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. So it's not enough just to say, God, I'm sorry, because you've hurt the entire church. So you go to God in the person of the priest and you say your sin and the priest on behalf of God in the whole church forgives and welcomes you back and loves you and it's reconciled, right? We have to always remember that the forgiveness and reconciliation that Jesus acquired us for us was acquired at the price of his blood. Never forget what it cost Jesus to forgive you. If you don't forget that, then you won't sin. It won't be as easy for you to sin right? Sometimes if you can be tempted by something or, you know, you start to get a jealous thought or you start to, um, you know, you're lazy, you don't want to get off the sofa or, you know, um, you're extra competitive with someone or you want to prove yourself right or something like that. Look at the cross. Look at the meek Lord. Look at his love, how gentle he was, how he said to the good thief, you know, um, you will be with me in paradise. 
How he said to the father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That will make you have a response similar to him. You know, there have been saints who have said there's nothing more solitary for the soul to draw them from sin than to meditate on the passion of Christ for a half hour every day. If you just think about the passion of Christ, you won't sin. And this reconciliation with the church is something that we see back in Scripture, in Matthew, where Jesus says to Simon Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Right? And for years, people used to do, um, you know, public penance. And if they've sinned, they'd have to go stand on the street corner. But the church decided to put kind of modesty on that and, and allow it to be alone between the priest and the penitent. So you don't have to, you know, you know, mortify, it's not mortify, like embarrass yourself so that people are more readily able to convert, right? And that seal of confession is so powerful, I'm going to talk about it, that it can never be disclosed what you say to a priest. It's, it's supposed, confession's supposed to be an example of that, like secret room of your heart and soul between you and God. And um, the priest cannot tell anything that you say in confession to another person, right? And in confession, God is acting through the church. So the sacrament of confession has two equally essential elements. On the one hand, the acts of the man who undergoes conversion through the action of the Holy Spirit. Namely, the person who goes to confession has to have contrition, confection, and satisfaction, right? But on the other hand, God's action through the intervention of the church in the priest in the sacrament. The church who through the bishop and his priests forgives sins in the name of Jesus Christ and determines the manner of satisfaction. That's when you're given a little penance. Say in our father, go do something kind for your mother, right? Pray a litany. And the priest also prays for the sinner and does penance with him. Priests suffer for those who sins that they forgive. Right? That's why you see such beautiful relationships in the lives of the saints between saints and their confessors, like Saint Faustina. You know, God granted her a priest that really understood her soul and was able to help her climb mountains, jump over mountains. Because when, you know, he would listen to her faults, really help point them out. But then he's praying for her and he's suffering for her, he's doing penance for her. He's helping her, right? And just because he can't reveal her sins from confession doesn't mean that they don't have an outside relationship. Look at St. Gemma Galgani. Her confessor wrote her, auto, her biography. There's a beautiful, thick book on St. Gemma's life. So you can still know the person. You just can't reveal their sins and what they said in the confessional, right? But you can have, you know, there were deep friendships that people had between their confessor and... Um, you know, themselves in the work that they were doing. Mother Teresa had it with priests, Conchita in Mexico with Archbishop Luis, um, Catherine of Siena with Raymond, St. Raymond. And I mean, there are all sorts of them. So, but it's just important that the priest did not reveal the sins that are said in the actual confessional, right? And then you have that prayer of absolution that's said about you, you know, upon you when, um, after you confess your sins, God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. So the priest is giving you forgiveness and that new peace back of Christ. And he says, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, in not my own name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Such a beautiful prayer. And among the penitent's acts, contrition occupies the first place. Contrition is sorrow of the soul and detestation for the sin committed, together with the resolution not to sin again. You have to be sorry about your sin 
And you have to be resolved not to sin again. You might. You might say, I never want to lie again. I never want to lie again. And three weeks later, somebody puts you in a corner and you lie and you think, you know, well, that just means you're weak and you need to go back to confession, right? But you have to dislike that sin so much that you don't want to. You're resolved not to sin again, okay? When that kind of contrition arises from love, by which God is loved above all else, it's called perfect contrition. And that kind of contrition forgives all sins. Perfect contrition is when you look at Jesus crucified and say, I love him so much, I never want to hurt him. That means that you're not saying, you know, I'm sorry I lied because you're afraid of hell. Or because, you know, it's somebody told you you had to say it. Or, you know, it has to come from love. Then it's perfect. But there is another form of contrition called imperfect contrition. It's a gift of God and a prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's born of the consideration of how ugly sin is. Oh, I don't want to be a liar. There might be vanity in that, but you still don't want to, right? Or the fear of eternal damnation and other penalties, right? That's a stirring of your conscience. That can still draw you to confession. And your sin can still be forgiven by a priest in confession. But when you are sorry for sin because of your love of God, then it's forgiven almost immediately because it's perfect contrition. Few people really have that such a love of God. That's why it's so important to pray for an inflammation of the love of God within our hearts. And it's important in the sacrament of confession for you to confess your sins. You can't just go and not say them. It's very important to have contrition, true sorrow for your sins, but you also have to say them, right? Confession to a priest is an essential part of the sacrament and all mortal sins, especially. So if you have a grave sin, you have to say it. Now, what's a mortal sin? It has to be grave and serious. You have to know it's grave and serious and you have to freely choose to do it anyway. Now, if you're being forced to do something, then you don't have the culpability of a mortal sin. Maybe it's a venial sin. Or if you didn't know it was as serious as it is, then your culpability is lessened, right? You have to have it be serious, know it's serious, and freely choose. But even then, a mortal sin can be forgiven in confession, right? Venial sins, excuse me, can be forgiven at mass, can be forgiven by that perfect contrition, right? And um, venial sins are still very good to say in confession because it helps us to resolve not to do them again and it strengthens us, right? But the catechism here in 1456 says, when Christ's faithful strive to confess all the sins that they can remember, they undoubtedly place all of them before the divine mercy for pardon. But those who fail to do so and knowingly withhold some, if you are saying, I'm not telling the priest that, they place nothing before the divine goodness for remission through the mediation of a priest. For if the sick person is too ashamed to show his wound to the doctor, the medicine cannot heal what it does not know. And the catechism says that you really should go to confession once a year. It's mandated by the church. But many saints, holy saints, said every week. You know, my dad, we were raised monthly, right? Um, but John Paul II, who was a saint, one of the greatest saints of ever, went every day. And you could say, how? What could he have done? Well, he probably saw little things, a little movement of his heart that was not perfectly in conformity with God, right? And he wanted to make sure he was a pure vessel, an instrument for the, for the church, to guide the church. Um, St. Francis de Sales, in the introduction of the devout life, said, my child, never allow your heart to abide with heavy sin, seeing that there is so sure and safe a remedy at hand. If you sin, run to confession. The saint recommended regular and frequent confession. His suggestion was weekly. <coughs> Excuse me. His suggestion was weekly and always before receiving communion. But back in his day, 
the norms of the church were different. You don't have to go every time you go to communion if you don't have mortal sin on your soul, right? But he says, although your conscience is not burdened with mortal sin, still go to confession. For in confession, you not only receive absolution for your venial sins, but you also receive great strength to help you in avoiding them henceforth. A clear light to discover your failings, an abundant grace to make up whatever loss you have incurred through those faults. Padre Pio also said once a week, you should go to confession. Even if a room is closed, it's necessary to dust it once a week, he used to say, right? And the catechism itself talks about that. In 1458, without being strictly necessary, confession of everyday faults, just venial sins, is nevertheless strongly recommended by the church. Indeed, the regular confession of our venial sins helps us form our conscience to fight against evil tendencies, to let ourselves be healed by Christ and progress in the life of the Spirit by receiving more frequently through the sacrament the gift of the Father's mercy. We are spurred to be merciful as he is merciful. And St. Augustine said, whoever confesses his sins is already working with God. God indicts your sins. If you also indict them, you are joined with God. Man and sinner are, so to speak, two realities. When you hear man, this is what God has made. When you hear sinner, this is what man made himself. God made us men and we made ourselves sinner. Destroy what you have made so that God may save what he has made. When you begin to abhor what you have made, it is then that your good works are beginning, since you are accusing yourself of your evil works. The beginning of good works is the confession of evil works. You do the truth and come to the light. And many sins wrong our neighbor. And the Catechism says not only do you need to go to confession for them, but one must do what is possible in order to repair them. So if you've stolen something, not only do you have to go to confession, you have to try to return it. If you ruined somebody's reputation by lies or by gossip, by dishonesty, by something that you said, you have the responsibility to restore the reputation of someone you slandered. So to go back and say, you know what? This really wasn't true. If you hurt somebody, you have to pay compensation for their injuries. That's justice, right? That's justice. And it talks about excommunication, which is when you commit a sin that's so great that you cut yourself off from the church completely. You know, when you hear about someone being excommunicated, it's not the church saying, I excommunicate you. It's the church confirming, yeah, you committed a sin that means that you're not part of us. And all that person needs to do is repent and come back and confess it with a desire never to commit it again, right? So you have a politician who is actively supporting the murder of babies and abortion and publicly preaching it. He's excommunicated himself. You're excommunicated if you commit, if you have an abortion or, um, or like are helping or promoting it, especially publicly because you're leading all these people to sin. But all that priest or that person needs to do is to say, you know what? I'm wrong. I won't do this anymore. I will be a pro-life politician now or I'll be a pro, you know, and to go to confession, then they can be part of the church again. But when you're excommunicated or when you commit a mortal sin like that, you better not go to communion, even if somebody's giving it to you, because you have already spit on God. And then to go up and to draw him to yourself is spitting on him again. It's the sin of desecration because you're putting something unholy, which is your soul, close to something holy, which is God right? And it, the, it also says priests must encourage all the faithful to come to the sacrament of penance and must make themselves available to celebrate the sacrament each time Christians reasonably ask for it. So even if it's not your confession time 
and somebody asks you, and it's reasonable, after Mass, can you please hear my confession? If you don't have something right away, the Catechism says you need to be able to make yourself available if it's reasonable, right? When he celebrates the sacrament of penance, the priest is fulfilling the ministry of the good shepherd, we talked about that, who seeks the lost sheep of the good Samaritan who binds up wounds, of the father who awaits the prodigal son and welcomes him on his return, of the just and impartial judge whose judgment is both just and merciful. The priest needs to be a sign and the instrument of God's merciful love for the sinner. The confessor is not the master of God's forgiveness, but its servant. So he's not saying, I decide who God forgives. No, he's the servant of who God wants to forgive. The minister of the sacrament should unite himself to the intention and the charity of Christ. It's so important that a priest have respect and sensitivity towards the person who comes to them that they're kind and gentle. He must pray and do penance for his penitent and entrust him to the Lord's mercy. And the church declares that every priest who hears confessions is bound under very severe penalties to keep absolute secrecy regarding the sins that his penitents have confessed to him. He can make no use of the knowledge that confession gives to him about his penitent's lives. This secret which admits of no exceptions, is called the sacramental seal because what the penitent has made known to the priest remains sealed by the sacrament. Many times when I would go to confession, the priest would say, great, but I want you to tell me this, this, and this when we leave the confessional, you know, or leave me a message about this so that I know it outside the confessional. Because then, like, when I see you, I know your sister's pregnant, right? Or I know that your mom is in trouble. Or, you know, there are things that he could help me with outside the confessional. So, Because in the confessional, anything said needed to stay there. What are the effects of the sacrament of confession? The whole power of the sacrament of penance consists in restoring us to God's grace and joining us with him in an intimate friendship. And if it's, if it's to unite us in a friendship with God, it's not just a laundry mat, right? Reconciliation is usually followed by peace and serenity of conscience with a strong spiritual consolation. So many people I know who hadn't been to confession in so long, and I talked them into it, went and they said, I felt a weight come off of me. There's this a new peace. And the sacrament reconciles us with the church, We talked about that. Sin damages or breaks fraternal communion. The sacrament of penance repairs or restores it. In this sense, it does not simply heal the one restored to ecclesial communion, but as a revitalizing effect on the life of the church, which suffered from the sin of one of her members. I help the entire church become holy by going to confession. And John Paul II said, it must be recalled that this reconciliation with God leads, as it were, to other reconciliations, which repair the other breaches caused by sin. The forgiven penitent is reconciled with himself in his inmost being, and that's why you have peace, where he regains his innermost truth. He's reconciled with his brethren, whom he is some way offended and wounded. A lot of times broken relationships will be healed if you have the humility to confess your wrong in them. He, he is reconciled with the church and reconciled with all of creation. And it's because the holiness of one profits others. That's why the communion of saints, you should have a real deep friendship with the saints in heaven because they don't have sin now if they're in heaven. And their holiness helps you become holy and they pray for you. And they pull, you know, they can help you make a good confession. You pray to them to help you. We should always have, you know, recourse to them. And I wanted to read here quickly the absolution prayer from the Byzantine liturgy because it's so beautiful. So we are used to the Roman Catholic liturgy. And that's the one that I just read, the prayer of absolution and confession. But in the Byzantine rite, which is still Catholic, 
When you go to confession, this is what they pray. May the same God who through the prophet Nathan forgave David when he confessed his sins, who forgave Peter when he wept bitterly because he denied Christ, right? The prostitute, when she washed his feet with her tears, the publican and the prodigal son, through me, the priest says, a sinner, forgive you both in this life and in the next and enable you to appear before his awe-inspiring tribunal without condemnation, he who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. So if you're afraid to go to confession, go back, meditate on these stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament where Jesus forgave. And it should give you um, a courage and a strength to go and ask for that same forgiveness. David sinned with Bathsheba. He, he killed a man and took his wife and had relations with her. And God forgave him through Nathan. God can forgive you. And in John is where we see Jesus give this power to the priests. On the evening of the first day of the week, Jesus showed himself to his apostles and he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins, they are forgiven. If you retain them, then they are retained. So here at the very end, just in summary, the sacrament of confession has three actions that are very important that the person going to confession needs to have. And then you have to have the priest's absolution. The person going to confession has to be repentant, really sorry, and, and you know, firm that they don't want to do this again. They have to confess that sin, say it, and they have to... Um, have the intention to make reparation, to make up for it, to do penance, to repair it, right? And the one who wants to obtain reconciliation with God and the church must confess to a priest all the unconfessed grave sins he remembers after you do a, uh, an examination of conscience. So you can't withhold sin, right? Or your confession doesn't, doesn't, isn't valid. But it's also good to confess venial faults. It's strongly recommended by the church. So don't ever let somebody tell you you shouldn't say that because even little faults are important to confess. And when you go to confession, you have spiritual effects in your heart. You're reconciled with God. You recover grace. You're reconciled with the church. You have remission of the eternal punishment incurred by mortal sin. You have remission, at least in part, of temporal punishments resulting from sin. You receive peace and serenity of conscience and spiritual consolation. And you have an increase of spiritual strength for the Christian battle never to sin again. Now, a couple other little things here. I told you this is going to be a little bit longer. I want to quickly go over the best way to make an examination of conscience for confession, right? And what I always tell people is you start with the Ten Commandments. See if you've broken any of them. So I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. What is your God? Is the coronavirus your God? Do you give more attention and concern to sickness than you to to God. Now, it's important to be prudent, to try to stay healthy, right? If you're sick, to take medicine. You know, if you're sick, not to get other people sick. But where is your heart? What is your God? Is it money? You know, is it popularity? Is it your reputation? You know, you would rather protect your own reputation than defend somebody in justice you should defend, right? So what's, who's your God? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Do you say, oh my God, right? Do you use Jesus' name in vain? Remember to keep holy the Lord's day. Do you go to Mass on Sunday and holy days of obligation? Do you do extra work on that day or do you try to make it special for him? Honor your father and mother. Now, when you're an adult, you don't have to do everything they say, but do you show them honor and respect in some way, right? You shall not kill. That means you shouldn't have an abortion. You shouldn't murder people. But you also shouldn't kill with your words. Kill someone's reputation. 
you know, kill somebody's self-confidence, kill somebody's love. You shall not commit adultery. Jesus says it's not only committing the act, but the desire to commit it, right? The man who lusts in his mind has already committed adultery. You shall not steal or cheat or lie, right? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That means not only should you not stand up in a court and lie about someone, that's wrong, but you should also not twist the truth to make yourself look better and make them look bad or like assume something that you're not really sure about. You really don't know what you're talking about. Maybe somebody told you, but you are not sure of that, right? Or especially if you haven't talked to the person yourself. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shouldn't be jealous of people. God gives everybody gifts for different reasons and different ways. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. And then if you feel like you're not committing anything in the area, go to the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Are you poor in spirit? Are you humble? Do you seek a simplicity of life? Or are you, um, you know, avarice? Blessed are the meek. How do you respond when people sin against you? Blessed are they who mourn. Are you despairing? Or do you suffer, are you, are you courageous to suffer with Christ with a hope that he conquers? Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after justice. Do you see what's right in a situation? Do you want God's will to be done? That's what it is to seek righteousness, right? Blessed are the merciful. Are you merciful? Blessed are the pure of heart. What's your intention? Blessed are the peacemakers. Do you try to create peace between people or division? Blessed are they that suffer persecution. How do you suffer persecution? Do you have the courage to do what God has asked, even if you'll suffer for it? Then I tell them, go to the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You know, charity, are you loving? Are you joyful? You might feel sorrow, but do you try to smile, to say alleluia? Do you try to give other people joy, even if you feel sorrow? Are you, do you give peace? Are you patient? Are you kind? Are you good? Are you generous? Are you gentle? Are you faithful? Are you modest? Do you practice self-control and chastity? You know, wisdom, do you listen to what God wants or do you make your own decisions? Understanding, do you seek to understand or to be understood? Counsel, you know, right judgment. How do you judge people? Are you judgmental? Or are you judging according to the compassionate heart of the Savior? Fortitude and courage. Do you have the courage to do the right thing when it's difficult? Knowledge. Do you study the teachings of the church? Piety. Do you show reverence to God? Fear of the Lord. Do you have that holy fear of God, that reverence before him? And then when you can't, you know, have, you know, find anything else. I say, if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, you'll find something, right? If you speak in human and angelic tongues, but don't have love, you're nothing. You're a resounding, you're resounding gong, right? If you have the gift of prophecy, if you can prophesize and tell mysteries to people, and if you have all the faith that you say to a mountain, move and it moves, but you have no love, you're nothing. If you give away everything you own and you give your body over so that you can boast and say, look how holy I am. You don't have love and you don't have love, then you gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not pompous, vain, prideful. It's not inflated. It's not rude. Love is not rude. Do you say thank you to people? Are you kind? Are you polite? Love does not seek its own interests. What's good for me and my vocation and my life? It's not quick tempered. It doesn't brood over injury, but you did this five years ago on the third day of March. You know, are you merciful? It doesn't rejoice over wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and it never, ever fails. So that's a good examination of conscience. Now, here are some people you can go to to intercede for you to go to confession, right? St. Alphonsus Liguri. 
he encouraged, he's a patron saint of confessions. He encouraged priests to exude the mercy and love of the sacred heart in confession. He not only encouraged people to come to confession, but he accompanied them closely on their path with Jesus. Like a father, he would draw them literally to himself to help them. The cure of ours, you know, he used to spend um, 16 to 18 hours a day in the confessional. People would come from all over to go to confession. He says, when you confess your sins, you take the nails out of Jesus. Think about that. When you don't want to go to confession, you're taking nails out of Jesus. And he says, God is quicker to forgive than a mother to snatch her child from the fire. And when people would come to him with problems, he always sent them away with St. Philomena. He loved St. Philomena. And every miracle that happened, he always attributed to her intercession. So she's a good one to pray to, too. If you have something difficult you have to say in confession or, you know, something that you're dealing with in regards to that sacrament, he would always send people to St. Philomena. St. John Nepomucene. This is really beautiful because... Um, he became a great preacher, and thousands of those he listened to changed their way of life. And he became the queen's confessor. But when the king was cruel to the queen, Father John taught her to bear her cross patiently. And on one day in 1393, the king asked him to tell him what the queen had said in confession. And Father John refused. So the king threw him into prison. A second time, he was asked to reveal the queen's confession. And he said, if you don't tell me, you will die. But if you obey my commands, riches and honors will be yours. And again, Father John said, the confessional, I can't reveal what was said in the confessional. So he was tortured. The king ordered him to be thrown into the river where he drowned. And a strange brightness appeared upon the water. He's known as the martyr of the confessional because he died for the seal of confession. Another priest that died because of the seal of confession is St. Jan Sarkanger. And it's interesting, St. John Nepomucene was Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakian. St. John Sarkanger, Sarkander was... Um, Czechoslovakian and Polish, right? So these Slavs are very serious about the sacrament. They're willing to give their life and their blood for that seal of confession. He was married for a short period of time, and when he was widowed, he became a priest. And um, he was active in the defense of the faith during a period of anti-Catholic sentiment and conflict. He himself was arrested on false accusations as a means of silencing him. And he refused to give in to his tormentors who tortured him for a whole month before he died. In 1620, during the Bohemian Revolt, they accused him of being a traitor and an instigator. So he was tortured in a prison. Then he was taken to Olmutz, where he was tortured in an effort to force him to provide them with information on his friend. One reason for him being tortured was due to his refusal to divulge what was said under the seal of confession, which priests are bound to enter. When tortured and forced to reveal details of his friend's confession, he said, I would choose with God's help rather to be torn in pieces than to sacrilegiously violate the seal of confession. So it wasn't that he just didn't want to betray his friend. He was also respecting that seal of confession. He was covered in flammable material and set on fire. Lighted candles as well as feathers soaked in oil and sulfur were placed on him and ignited. The rack was used on him on February 13th, and again on the 17th and 18th. It would last two to three hours. For one month, he survived all of these attempts to burn him alive. The torture eventually ended with his mar death on March 17th, 1620. And when he was brought, when his remains were unburied after he died, he was incorrupt. So here they burned his flesh and then he was incorrupt. Why? Because his soul was so pure, he wouldn't break the confessional. 
another one who was killed for the confessional, and I love, love him, and his feast day is tomorrow, February 6th, St. Mateo Correa Magal Magalanes. He's Mexican. He was born um, on July 23rd, 1866, and he was ordained in 1893. He dedicated himself to his ministry with enthusiasm. He was a notable preacher, moving many people to the sacrament of confession with his words. Overworked and needed, needing refuge, he agreed to stay in a house in the country in 1926. A month later, Father Correa was arrested by a group of federal army soldiers. And on February 5th, he was jailed at the seminary, which had been transformed into a military headquarters. A few hours later, he appeared before the general who ordered him to hear the confessions of the rebels who were sentenced to die. After complying with the order and encouraging the condemned men to die honorably, the general ordered him to violate the sacramental seal and reveal matters that were divulged during the confessions. I will never do that, was the priest's response. When the infuriated general threatened to shoot him, Father Correa responded, you may do so, but you ignore the fact, general, that a priest may, must keep the secret of confession. I am ready to die. At dawn the next day, February 6th, a group of soldiers took him to the graveyard. Before entering in a lonely spot covered with grass, the priest was killed with a hail of bullets. His body was abandoned and laid there for three days without burial. And today they have his relics. So St. Matteo also died for not breaking the seal of confession. St. Leopold Mondich is also a patron of confessions. And when you go to Medjugorje in, in Bosnia, outside of St. James Church there, they have a statue of St. Leopold because he was Croatian. He was born in 1866, the youngest of 12 children. And he suffered from many physical ailments, but he became a Capuchin priest and was ordained in 1890. His poor health prevented him from being sent as a missionary, but he spent his time hearing confessions and giving spiritual direction. He would spend 15 hours a day in the confessional, and he died while preparing for Mass in 1942. So St. Leopold Mandich is also a very powerful intercessor. And of course, Padre Pio... Can you see him up there? You can't. I meant to pull him down, our Padre Pio. I will, as long as this is a long podcast, right? You got to pull my Padre Pio down. When I was at Notre Dame, my friends bought me this and said he would be important. And he is. He's my best friend. <laughs> Let's see here. Padre Pio also spent his whole life in the confessional, basically. And he had a gift of reading hearts, right? Sorry, Padre. And there are many stories about how he knew what people were going to say in order to help them, right? A man once went to St. Giovanni Rotondo to confess to him. It was between 1954 and 1955. When he finished, Padre Pio said, do you have anything else to confess? And he said, no, Father. And he kept repeating it. And he said, no, Father. And then um, the Holy Spirit spoke through Padre Pio, who yelled, go away, go away, because you are not reformed of your sin. But the man was petrified, and he didn't know what he was supposed to do. And Padre Pio said, keep silent, gossiper. You have spoken enough. Now I want to speak. Do you go to discos, right? Yes, Father. And he said, well, don't you know that's an invitation to sin? So he told him what he was doing that he didn't even see in his own conscience. One day a man told Padre Pio, Father, I tell lies when I'm with friends of mine. And Padre Pio said, do you want to go to hell by joking, right? Gossip. When a person speaks badly of a friend, he destroys the reputation and honor of a brother or a sister who has a right to enjoy respect. One day, Padre Pio said to a penitent, when you gossip about a person, it means that you have removed the person from your heart. But be aware, when you remove a man from your heart, Jesus goes away from your heart with that man. 
Once Padre Pio was invited to bless a house, but when he reached the entrance of the kitchen, he said, there are snakes in here. I don't want to go in. Then he said to a priest that wanted, went to that house to eat, don't go to that house because they say unpleasant things about their brothers and sisters in that kitchen, right? And there's, there is um, a story where he said that when you swear and you curse, the devil is always there. You, in a hotel, it was not possible to rest neither during the day or at night because there was a girl who was possessed and shouted for hours. Everyone was frightened of her. The child's mother brought her every day to the church, hoping that Padre Pio would free the child of the evil spirit. The child also shouted a lot in church. One day when Padre Pio had finished hearing the woman's confessions, he met the child that howled fearfully in front of him. The child was being held back with difficulty by two or three men. The saint was annoyed by the whole uproar and kicked the child with his foot. And then he struck the child's head and said, enough. The child fell to the ground as if she was sleeping. Padre Pio told a doctor who was standing there to bring the child to St. Michael in the sanctuary of Monte San Angelo. When the group reached the destination, they entered the cave where St. Michael had appeared. The child revived, but nobody succeeded in bringing her near to the altar of the angel. In the midst of the confusion, a monk took the hand of the child and touched the altar. She fell down as if she had been struck by lightning. A few minutes later, she woke up as if nothing had happened and asked her mother, could you buy me ice cream? At that point, the group of people returned and told Padre Pio what had happened. But he said to the mother, say to your husband not to curse anymore. Otherwise, the demon will return, right? Padre Pio was very hard about missing mass, right? Because it's a mortal sin. He was angry when people would partake in magic, right? Or when people say, oh, I can read your, you know, what, whatever it is. It's very a grave sin. Padre Pio, Pio prohibited all magic, spiritism, and practices of bad magic. A lady said, I confessed to Padre Pio in November 1948, and among the things I told him was that we were worried about our aunt who read tarot cards in our family. And Padre Pio said, throw that stuff away as soon as you can, right? One day, even Satan hated Padre Pio's work in the confessional that he came and he appeared in the confessional like a penitent and tried to go to confession. And Padre Pio was, was scared of him and said, say, long live Mary and Jesus. And he couldn't. As soon as he said, long live Jesus and Mary, Satan disappeared. And now at the end. Here are some qu quotes of the saints on the sacrament of confession. I don't know where to put my Padre Pio without him falling. Will he fit right here? Well, there we go. At least till we finish, right? You can look at Padre Pio right under Jesus. See, he's going to want him to block Jesus, but we're almost finished anyway. Right? There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori. Good Christians make an examination of conscience and an act of contrition every evening. You should go over what you've done wrong during that day. There was a devout monk lying at the point of death, and when his superior came and told him to make his confession, he answered, Blessed be God, I have for 30 years made an examination of conscience every evening and have made my confession every day as if I were at the point of death. So that was very pleasing to God. Jesus said to St. Faustina, My daughter, just as you prepare in my presence, so also you make your confession before me. The person of the priest is, for me, only a screen. Never analyze what sort of priest it is that I am making use of. Open your soul in confession as you would to me, and I will fill it with my light. So that's what I was saying at the beginning. It doesn't matter who the man of the priest is. And even if, you know, sometimes people say, but he said this, you are making your confession to Christ and he will give you light. Hopefully he's making use of the priest to give you light. He might give you a thought, 
you know, in the confessional or afterwards when you're doing your penance there in church, that he will fill you with light because you're confessing to Jesus, not to the priest, right? St. Francis de Sales says, go to your confessor, open your heart to him, display to him all the recesses of your soul. Take the advice that he will give you with the utmost humility and simplicity. For God, who has an infinite love for obedience, frequently renders profitable the counsels we take from others, but especially from those who are guides of our souls, right? And if you have a regular confessor, which is kind of helpful, someone that you really can trust, then just do what they say, right? Even if you, you're not sure about something, that humility of obedience is a powerful tool to help you grow in holiness. And St. Alphonsus Liguri says that obedience to a confessor is the most acceptable offering we can make to God, the most secure way of doing the divine will, right? St. Thomas Aquinas says, in the life of a body, in the life of the body, a man is sometimes sick, and unless he takes medicine, he'll die. Even so, in the spiritual life, a man is sick on account of sin. For that reason, he needs medicine so that he may be restored to health. And this grace is bestowed on him in the sacrament of penance. And St. Augustine says, if you excuse yourself in confession, if you try to make excuses for what you've done, you shut up sin within your soul and you shut out pardon. You need to go with contrition saying, this is wrong and I'm sorry and I won't do it again, right? And Jesus told St. Faustina, daughter, when you go to confession to this fountain of mercy, the blood and water which came forth from my heart always flows down upon your soul and ennobles it. Every time you go to confession, immerse yourself in my mercy with great trust so that I may pour the bounty of my grace upon your soul. When you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here, the misery of the soul meets the mercy of God. Tell souls that from this fount of mercy, souls draw graces solely with the vessel of trust. If their trust is great, there is no limit to my generosity. The torrents of grace inundate humble souls. The proud remain always in poverty and misery because my grace turns away from them to humble souls. Pope John Paul II said, confession is an act of honesty and courage, an act of entrusting ourselves beyond sin to the mercy of a loving and forgiving God. St. John of the Cross says, strive always to confess your sins with a deep knowledge of your own wretchedness and with clarity and purity, right? And the cure of ours, St. John Vianney, who spent like 16 hours a day in a confessional, said, we come to confession quite preoccupied with the shame we feel. We accuse ourselves with hot air. It is said that many confess and few are converted. And I believe it so, my children, because few confess with tears of repentance. See, the misfortune is that people do not reflect. If one said to those who work on Sundays, to a young person who had been dancing for two to three hours, to a man coming out of a drunken house, what have you been doing? You've been crucifying the Lord. They would be quite astonished because they do not think of it like that. My child, if we thought of it, we would be seized with horror. It would be impossible for us to do evil. For what has the good God done to us that we should grieve him thus and put him to death again? Him who has redeemed us from hell. It would be well if all sinners, when they're going to their guilty pleasures, could, like St. Peter, meet our Lord on the way, who would say to them, I am going to that place where you are going yourself to be crucified again. Perhaps that would make them reflect. Jesus said to St. Faustina, 
A soul does not benefit from the sacrament of confession if it's not humble. Pride keeps it in darkness. The soul neither knows how nor is willing to probe with precision the depths of its own misery. It puts on masks and avoids everything that might bring it recovery. My daughter, just as you prepare in my presence, so also you make your confession before me. The person of the priest is for me only a screen. Never analyze what sort of priest it is that I am making use of. Open your soul in confession as you would to me, and I will fill it with my light. I already read that. Maybe I printed some of these twice. One more from St. Faustina. Tell souls where they are to look for solace. That is in the tribunal of mercy, in the confessional. There is the greatest mir- there the greatest miracles take place and are incessantly repeated. To avail oneself of this miracle, it is not necessary to go on a great pilgrimage or carry out some external ceremony. It suffices to come with faith to the feet of my representative to reveal to him one's misery and the miracle of divine mercy will be fully demonstrated. Were a soul like a decaying corpse, so that from a human standpoint there would be no hope of restoration and everything would already be lost, it is never so with God. The miracle of divine mercy restores a soul in full. How miserable are those who do not take advantage of the miracle of God's mercy. You call out in vain and it will be too late. My daughter, when you go to confession, this fountain of mercy... The blood and water which come forth from my heart always flows down upon your soul and ennobles it. Every time you go to confession, immerse yourself in my mercy with great trust so that I may pour the bounty of my grace upon your soul. When you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting by you, waiting for you. I am hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here, the misery of a soul meets the mercy of God. Tell souls that from this fountain of mercy, souls draw graces solely with a vessel of trust. If their trust is great, there is no limit to my generosity. The torrents of grace inundate humble souls. The proud remain always in poverty and misery because my grace turns away from them to humble souls. And St. John Chrysostom says, after confession, a crown is given to penitence. At the very end, we pray a prayer to St. Gerard Magella, the patron of a good confession. St. Gerard, patron of a good confession, who gave courage to souls whom fear and shame had overcome, who gave sorrow to their hearts, resolution to their wills, truth to their faltering lips, help me to make a good confession. Enable me to know my sins, to be truly sorry for them, and to be firmly resolved, with God's grace, never to sin again. Help me to confess my sins humbly and sincerely, to confess them in spirit of faith as confessing them to our Lord himself. Stand by me in my confession, O gentle saint, an angel of God sent to free me from sin. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. I will be praying for you to be able to make the best confession of your lives this Lent. And I ask you to continue to please pray for me and for all those who listen to this podcast. Thank you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. 
Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.